Anna the prophetess did what none of us will ever be able to do in this lifetime. She saw face to face Jesus the Christ, stood in His presence, saw His glory face to face. That will, we will never experience in this life. This morning, part of my everyday morning routine is to go online and to read the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I was reading the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Usually, actually, I just read the sports sections of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. And I was on the pirate section of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. And it had an article on Roberto Clemente, the great one. The greatest, one of the greatest baseball players in Pittsburgh pirate history. It's his anniversary of his death. Forty years ago today, Roberto Clemente died in a plane crash taking relief supplies to Nicaragua. And I, and I remember as a kid watching Roberto Clemente play baseball. I never was up close or touched him but I saw him in right field, and I watched him on TV. And even now I can see clips whenever I would want to of Roberto Clemente and some of the great plays. I remember that one where he's running deep into center field, makes an over-the-head catch, turns and fires home a strike to home plate. He had a power of an arm. I remember one day I met a friend's father who was a tailor in Pittsburgh. And he spoke with a very broken Italian accent. And he told me he was at one time, he was the pirate tailor. And he actually met and made clothes for Roberto Clemente. Well, I just sat in awe. But we will never see clips of Jesus. There aren't clips. And we won't be like Anna or John, the beloved disciple. We won't have memories of seeing him face to face, eyeball to eyeball, seeing and witnessing the things that he did. John, the beloved disciple, he begins his account of his time with Jesus. He writes at the end of his life, and he writes down what he remembers what he experienced with Jesus. And these, this is how he opens his gospel. He says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. I love the words. We, have, we saw His glory. We beheld His glory. The glory of the one and only. I mean, John would remember how he first met Jesus. That he was following John the Baptist. And John the Baptist looked at Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so John and Andrew, they go and they follow Jesus and they spend the day with Him. And then they go and find their brothers and say, We found the Messiah. I mean, I think of those people who encountered Jesus while He walked this earth. And what a privilege and honor that would be to to look back and to have those memories. To be there when He healed that paralytic or to be present when he taught by the sea, or when he fed the 5,000, or to be Bartimaeus and to be there when he healed Bartimaeus, or when he healed the leper, or be Martha and Mary when Lazarus was raised from the tomb, or Jairus when his daughter was healed. There's so many that we know of and many others that we don't, but who had that privilege and that honor of of seeing Jesus face to face and to hear Him teach and to hear Him say to countless peoples, your faith has made you well, go and sin no more. But we'll we'll never have that. 
we, it's past. It's gone. It's not within our grasp. So we'll never see Jesus in this life face to face, flesh to flesh, eyeball to eyeball. But we can behold his glory. We can affirm with John, we have beheld his glory, the glory of the one and only. And we can do that through, through nature. We can do that um, through the events of life and through the scriptures. We can see in nature God's great glory. There's a convent in um, New Bedford, Pennsylvania, run by the Sisters of Humility. And I would sometimes go there for some silent time, some quiet time. Um, they, they had little retreats, a retreat place. And I was there one time, they had a pond. <clears throat> and the pond was probably about as big as this sanctuary. Uh, and they had on the side, like over there, some benches that you could sit on. I was sitting on the benches, and it was a windy day. I mean, the wind was just gusting across the pond from north to south, let's say. And I could see as I sat the rippling of the water and the wind blowing. And I noticed birds just kind of flowing down across the pond. And I watched these birds do what I never thought or believed or imagined birds would do. They would fight against the wind, going going into the wind, to the end of the pond. They would turn, they would get into the wind stream, and they would zip down the pond. And then they'd fly back. And then they would zip down the pond. And I think, I thought, Those birds are just having fun. I mean, they're taking a break from the things of the day, from the to-do list, just to have fun. I never thought birds just want to have fun. But in that moment, I thought, what a powerful beauty of God's creation that he creates even the birds to have fun and to enjoy their life. And sometimes we, we can see God's glory in the events of life. Years ago, I read a little story of a woman, a widow, lived in the 1800s in a small western town. And I, I visualize this town being towns that you would see back on the old TV shows of Rifleman and Gunsmoke, you know, those old little towns with the wooden buildings connected together, had a wooden walkway, a little roof over it. Well, I imagine she lived like in one of those little houses in town. And there was a town, as they all had them on TV shows, the town drunkard. And this woman, the widow, was a woman of faith. Uh, And the drunkard was not. Uh, And one day he was walking by her place, And she and her son were running out of food. So she was praying out loud in her little house, Lord, send me a sack of flour and a side of bacon. Lord, I need a sack of flour and a side of bacon. And he overheard this. And so he thought he would put to rest this rumor that there really is a God. And he thought, well, I'll do. I'll go and buy a sack of flour the side of bacon. I'll put it on her doorstep. And then when she finds it, she'll tell everybody in town that how God provided and then I'll burst the bubble. I'll tell her it was not God. There is no God. I bought the sack of flour and the side of bacon. And so he did that. He bought a sack of flour, side of bacon, put it on her doorstep. Sure enough, she found it. Sure enough, she went about telling the townspeople how God had provided miraculously. A God had answered her prayer and provided her and her son with a sack of flour and a side of bacon. And there was his moment. He said, you're wrong. You're absolutely wrong. There is no God. He said, I delivered. I put that sack of flour and side of bacon on your doorstep. And she said, no, you're wrong. There is a God. You, the devil, might have delivered it but it was God who provided it. She saw in those moments of life 
God's power and majesty. And we can see it if we open our eyes to the things around us and the events of life. We can see God's power and God's majesty. We can behold His glory through the events of life and through the people we meet and through the encounters and how God provides for us. And we can, we can experience God. We can behold His glory. We can see His glory through Scripture. One of the things we, we cannot ever be at those miracles. Those events have happened and they're past. But we can experience them through our imaginations. One of the great gifts that God has given to us is our imagination. I didn't realize that as a child when I was daydreaming in school that this was a great gift. But we can visualize and imagine what it would be like to be at those scenes. I remember one time reflecting and, and trying to imagine the scene of Jesus when he cleanses the leper. The leper comes running down and kneels before Jesus, says, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And I, and I was wondering, what, what did that leper feel like? Or what did it feel like to be a leper, to be an outcast, to, to be one who wasn't a lot around people? And if you got too close, it was okay to throw stones at you to chase you away. What would it be like to feel that kind of pain? And I remembered a time when I was in the Air Force and stationed in Turkey. <clears throat> a friend and I had an apartment in this little town, and he had got a puppy. Well, the puppy grew into a pretty big dog, bigger than our apartment could hold. And so he said he found a home for the dog on a farm, and it would be good. Well, several weeks later, maybe months, I was walking on the streets, and I saw Shep, the dog, at a little distance. And it was sad. He was skin and bones. His head was down, his tail was down, and he looked terrible. And I called his name. I said, Shep. And he looked up, he saw me, he picked up his head, he wagged his tail, he started to come towards me. And then there were a couple little kids off to the side. And stray dogs in Turkey at that time were dangerous. And so they picked up some stones and they threw the stones at Shep and Shep went off. And I never saw the dog again. But in that moment, I, that sadness that I felt for him, that pain and anguish that I felt, that he must have felt that the sadness was what I thought that's what the leper felt. That, that he was rejected. And yet he comes to Jesus in that kind of pain and anguish. And he kneels before Jesus. And he says, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And the scriptures say that Jesus was compassionate. And I imagine a feeling of a, of a tear coming to his eye. As he ponders that question, if you are willing, as if he would not be willing. The leper knew he had the power. The question was not do you have the power, but do you have the desire? And Jesus reached out and said, I'm willing and the leper is clean. And I, I can imagine to some level you know, being that leper, because there are times in life when you feel that sense of rejection, like Shep felt, when the world is against you, and you're at your lowest point, and you come before Jesus, and you want to say, if you're willing, and Jesus says, oh, I'm willing, and he touches us. See, I think when we get the inscription, we can, we can begin to reflect and begin to imagine what it would be like to be Anna in the temple. That we can experience God in another way and to say, I beheld His glory, the glory of the one and only. We'll, we'll never walk with Jesus as the disciples did or all of those who experienced and encountered Him. That opportunity is not the path where we, we can walk. But we can, like John, say, I beheld his glory. 
I see His glory. I have experienced His power and His might. I know the power of the living Christ. And we can, we can see and experience His glory in nature, in the events of life, and in the Scriptures. So while we can never walk with Jesus, see Him face to face, touch Him, we can with John, with Anna, affirm and say, we have beheld His glory. The glory of the one and only. Let us pray. Father, we do praise You and thank You that You are a God who has not left us alone, but a God who abides always with us and who reveals Yourself to us in many different ways. So Lord, we would ask that in the coming days and in the coming year You would reveal Yourself to us that we might know that You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Creator God, the One of all power and all majesty and all power. For it's in Your name we pray. Amen.